everybody, and welcome back to another episode on the Data Pack tutorial series with me, your host, Curtis is a dig. In today's episode, we are going to be covering functions. Now you may be wondering, Curtis, what is a function? And if you're wondering that, no worries, this is the video for you. But before I can talk about what a function is, I first need to talk about what a command is. A command is a line of text that performs an action in game. You'll commonly see them referred to as sheets, and you'll normally see them with a slash, the command name, and whatever criteria it requires. In this case, I'm gonna use slash kill at S, and I input that, and Curtis does a dig has been killed. But that is just one of the very, very many commands that Minecraft has to offer. In reality, Minecraft has so, so many different commands that we can use. As you can see, this is the list of all the different ones we have. And the cool thing about functions is we, we can put these things together. We can put multiple commands in a row to get a desired effect. It's kind of similar to how the command blocks work. And if you haven't worked with command blocks before, let me show you how they work. The first command block will have the command in it. The second command block will also have a command in it. And if it's linked together, both of them will run in the order that these arrows are pointing. So this one will run first, followed by the second one. We can even take a look at a little bit of a bigger one, which has three nodes, but they all connect together through those arrows. Now this is great and all, but it takes a physical space in the world to be able to run this, which I gotta say, that that's not ideal. Sure, it'll work, but we can make it so that it doesn't take any physical space in the game at all. I am unfortunately getting a little bit ahead of myself though. So let's take a moment to actually talk about how commands work. Each command has its own name, as you can see right here at the bottom left of my screen. And to use that command, we have to use this name specifically. So let's go ahead and type in kill. That's the one we tested out at the beginning of the video. And this takes in what's called a target selector. What a target selector is, well, it, it's in its name. It selects a target. So we have at A, this will select every single player. At E lets you specify every entity, which you can also use to choose a specific entity. Entity. There is at P, which selects the nearest player. At R, selects a random player. At S, selects the current entity. And then you could also specify by player name. Now those by themselves are quite limiting because there's no way, as far as we can see currently, to select an entity based on their data. Well, look no further. We're gonna fix that right now. If I do at E, I can also enter some square brackets. And in these square brackets, we can specify entity data to choose from. So if I go down and let's go ahead and find for example, let's do distance. If I do distance equals and I do dot dot five, that's gonna kill every entity within five blocks. So let's spawn some in and we can test that out. Here we have an assortment of pigs. There are six in total going six blocks out. After I press enter on this command, five of those pigs and myself should be killed. Let's find out. So it was a little tiny bit off. There are two pigs remaining, and that's probably because maybe I wasn't fully on the block. I was a little bit further away, but this went out a couple blocks and did not kill the rest, which is what I wanted to emphasize with that distance check. So we can use the target selector and some data to figure out which entity we are selecting, which is extremely useful. Some commands also take in coordinates, such as the teleport command, which you can put in some numbers, for example, to teleport. But did you know you could also use the tilde key? But before I show you how to use the tilde key, I wanna show you on the F3 menu, we can find this section right here that says facing south towards positive Z. And this will show you which direction you are facing. Right now it's at positive Z, but if I rotate, we're at positive X, negative Z, and negative X. Positive Y is looking straight up and negative Y is looking straight down. Now the reason this is important is because those tilde keys rely on those directions. For for example, negative three on this last tilde key is backwards along the Z axis. So towards negative Z. So we're gonna move backwards right now when I press enter, like so. And likewise, if we put it on the second tilde, if we put 10, we're gonna move 10 blocks upward like so. And if we did it on the first tilde key, we're gonna be moving on the X axis. So in this case, we're gonna move positive five on the X axis, which is towards this obsidian box. 
like so. Next we have the carrot key, which kind of works a little bit similar. This is the upwards arrow looking symbol on your keyboard. And what this does is it moves you in the direction you are facing. So right now I'm facing towards the beacon. If we do that on the Z axis, so this third carrot, it's gonna move us 10 blocks forward like so. Now, something to keep in mind is that this is where your face is facing. So if I look a little bit upwards and I do that, I'm gonna be in the air and I'm gonna fall down. That's because that is my forward direction like so. But this is one way you can get it to be based off of where the player is looking rather than what their current position is. Unfortunately, Minecraft doesn't allow you to mix the tilde key with the carrot key. So I can't stay at my X position or my Y position and also move along my Z facing direction. It just doesn't work that way. All right, now that we know how to use target selectors, now that we know how to use the coordinate system and the facing direction, we can get started on actually making some functions. Making functions it's actually super duper easy all we have to do is go to our namespace folder in my case i have it named testing underscore data pack we can right click that go to new folder and we're going to type in functions inside of our functions folder we're going to create a new file and we're going to name it whatever we want our function to be called in this case i'm just going to call it test and we're going to put at the end of that dot mc function do not forget this otherwise it will not work there we go function is created in today's example what i'm going to do is when this function is called it's going to spawn an anvil over the player every five seconds so let's go ahead and get started with that we're going to start off first with set block and let's go ahead and put in the player's coordinates, which at default is going to be just these three tilde keys. And for the third number, let's go ahead and put 20. So this is going to put a block 20 blocks above the player. And let's go ahead and put in an anvil. And so that'll spawn an anvil 20 blocks above the player. It will, however, replace the block that is there. So we, we are going to want to make sure that we don't do that. So we're going to add this keep tag at the end of it. Next, we're going to do something called schedule, which is another command. It allows us to add a new function to our schedule list. So we go ahead and put in our function testing underscore data pack colon test, and this will schedule the function in five seconds. If we put five T, that's going to be five ticks. If we put five S, that's going to be five seconds. And if we put five D, that's going to be five Minecraft days. In this case, we're going to put five S. And what's going to happen is the first time this function runs, it's going to set the anvil way above the player. And it's going to schedule the next time it's going to fall, which is in five seconds. And when that five seconds is up, it's going to call the function again, which will constantly have it repeating. So let's go ahead and save that and we'll try it out in Minecraft. Oh, but wait, 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 hold your horses. We still need to do something before we're actually able to use it. We have to type in slash reload for the data pack to reload. Any change that we make to this data pack, we have to reload when we're testing it. So let's reload it and we'll type in slash function and then we'll go ahead and put in the namespace testing underscore data pack colon test. And let's see, we have anvils falling, that's one. And then in five seconds, another one should appear. I'm trying to watch out. Where is it? No, seriously, where is it? Hello? Oh, ho, ho, I tricked you guys. Come take a look. As you see, there's an anvil falling every five seconds from right here. Now, why do you think that is? I'll wait. Ah, just kidding. Okay, so the reason this is happening is because when we do a schedule for a function, the thing that called the function is no longer the player. So these coordinates don't actually refer to the player at all. So we are actually spawning in the anvil from the server's perspective. And these are the server's coordinates plus 20 on the Y axis. This is definitely not ideal. So what can we do to fix this? So what we can do is instead of doing the set block right away, we're gonna use a new command called execute which takes a couple different parameters. As you can see, we have all these different parameters for the execute, but in this case, we're gonna do at, and then we're gonna do at a. So at the word, and then at the symbol a, run, set block, the coordinates, anvil, keep. Now what this does is it's gonna execute whatever command that we're trying to run based on these parameters. So in this case, we're gonna execute it based on the position of all the players. So it's it's not just gonna be me that has Anvil spawning over them if other players join. We can also add some more parameters to this if we just go and add as at A. Now instead of only running at 
every single player. It's also going to run as every single player instead of as the server. So let's go ahead and try that out in Minecraft. So as usual, we have to press in the slash reload function because we've made some changes to the data pack. And now if I call this function, let's see, an anvil should fall and in five seconds, another one should fall as well. Yep, there we go. And I am now in danger if I were in survival mode. Luckily, I'm not. Okay, but now this is a problem. It's raining anvils everywhere and I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to, to stop this. How do we stop this? Well, we can do slash schedule clear and whatever that function was, in this case, it's testing underscore data pack colon test. And so now that schedule is no longer activated. No more anvils should rain from the sky. Neat. Now we are going to remove the schedule function because we're going to do a new test. Now you may be wondering how we're going to get this to repeat if we no longer have that schedule. Well, it's quite simple. In our Minecraft namespace folder, we're going to create a new folder called tags. And inside of that folder, we're going to create another folder called functions. And inside that folder, we're going to make a new file and let's call it tick.json. Don't forget the .json part, otherwise it won't work. Now inside of this tick.json file, we're going to add a set of curly brackets followed by quotes with the word values and it's gonna autocomplete, at least in my case, with a colon and a set of square brackets. Inside of those square brackets, we're gonna add a set of quotes and we're gonna put in testing underscore data pack colon test. Now, what this is gonna do is every single tick, it is going to spawn in an anvil. This is scary because I don't know if you know this, but there are 20 ticks in a Minecraft game second. So let's save these and we are gonna go to Minecraft. Let's let's head over here because I don't want a bunch of anvils around this area, but we're gonna type in slash reload. And because this is in the tick.json file, it's gonna automatically start play. Here we go. And as you can see, we now have a bunch of anvils spawning every single tick. It's, it's getting quite laggy because of all the all the falling entities. This is this is not a good idea. I, I I probably I probably shouldn't have done this. What what have I done? But no worries, we can always disable the data pack, which will stop this. There we go. No more anvils falling from the sky, which uh, I, I'm kind of glad. If we were to rename tick.json to load.json, instead of it happening every single tick, it's only gonna happen at the start of the data pack's reload. So let's go ahead and reload that data pack and eventually an anvil should fall onto my head. It just takes a moment to reload sometimes. There we go. But you'll see it only happened once and it's not gonna happen again because load is only called once every time it reloads, which I think is super useful. So let's see, we're able to call a function when the data pack is loaded. We're able to call one every tick and we're able to specify a schedule for functions that can happen every few ticks, every few seconds or every few in-game Minecraft dates. But what if you want it to happen for a specific event? If you remember my advancements video, you'll remember how to create an advancement. And back then I said, that there was a way that we can set up a function to be called when an advancement is triggered. In this example, I have an advancement for when the player consumes glowberries. And the reward for that is a function glowberries colon cause underscore glow. And what this will do is it's going to call the function from that namespace, which will do as follows. It'll say what for some reason, let's get rid of that. But the most important part is it'll check for any player that has the advancement consume glowberries and will give them the effect for is glowing. Afterwards, it'll remove the advancement, which is basically going to make it so after you eat the glowberries, the advancement gets revoked so that the next time you eat glowberries, we'll be able to check this again. Honestly, that's probably all you need to know about functions. If you want to learn more about it, I highly suggest taking a look at all of the different commands in Minecraft, as well as checking out what execute can do, such as these parameters, as well as the target selector parameters. And of course, checking out the advancement triggers, because in combination, you can do some pretty amazing things. For example, with the right set of commands, you can create your own universal rotation wrench, which can rotate every single rotatable block in the game. But the possibilities are nearly limitless. So I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, if you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to get notified when I upload a video. If you're not following already, please consider following me on Twitter, Instagram, and supporting me on Patreon, all at Curtis's a dig. Thank you guys so much for watching and hope to see you guys in the next data pack tutorial. Have a good one.